Natural disasters are a threat to society. We never know when a disaster may strike. So what measures must we implement to protect life and property from disaster? The lessons of the past can teach us a great deal. For example, when rescuing people from buildings collapsed in an earthquake, every second counts. The entire second floor fell right down. I was on the floor below. I couldn't move. But it took all my strength to call for help. Amid the aftershocks, it was nearby residents who searched the wreckage, straining to hear any voices. Many risked their lives to rescue the victims. I happened to be one of the lucky ones, rescued at the hands of my neighbors. But the situations of people trapped in collapsed buildings varied widely. Of course, I'm sure there were many cases in which human hands could not rescue everyone. Sometimes, victims are beyond the reach of rescue by human hands. What I experienced in the aftermath of the earthquake, as the aftershocks rumbled on, was the overwhelming power of nature. As firefighters, our credo is never give up. But the power of natural disasters can be overwhelming. Even if we're determined to defeat them, there's a limit to human power and ability. Situations such as these call for disaster response robots. In disaster areas, human effort is powerless against the titanic forces of nature. But with the right tools, such as robots, we can mount an effective response. Efforts to develop disaster response robots are ongoing in the Impact Tough Robotics Challenge. We want to make robot technology tougher. Tough robots are a necessity in disaster zones. Until now, even the most capable robots have been fragile unable to work in disaster-stricken areas. Robot technology has to be able to function effectively even in the severe environments of disaster zones. For example, drones are out of the question if they won't fly when it's raining or if the wind is too strong. Image sensing technologies that are used for searching through rubble are of no use to us if they can't see in the darkness inside chaotic wreckage. Robots, on the other hand, must operate successfully under the harshest conditions. We are aiming for such robust technologies. Five types of robots are being developed in the Tough Robotics Challenge. They are aerial robots, which survey damage immediately after the disaster. Cyber rescue canines, which discover victims. Serpentine robots, which search for victims deep inside rubble. Construction robots, which can do difficult recovery work. And legged and serpentine robots, used to inspect industrial facilities. Each of these robots incorporates never before seen technologies, making this a challenge like no other. Serpentine robots search for victims at disaster sites or work inside damaged or old plants. These robots must be able to move nimbly through debris in danger of further collapse, proceed through narrow confines, and overcome obstacles. It's extremely difficult to create a robot that can both move through narrow spaces and overcome obstacles. That's why the team developed these wheel-type serpentine robots. This robot has a large number of vertical joints as well as horizontal joints, which enable it to overcome obstacles easily. Because it has so many joints, it would be impractical for a human operator to control each individual joint directly. So instead, the operator directs the movement of the robot's snake head. The head is directed to move up, down, left or right, and the instructions passed on consecutively to the joints behind it. The entire robot can be controlled with a simple series of operating instructions. The biggest issue is how to make the robot perform tasks. In the case of a gas leak, we want to command it to shut off the gas stopcock and open a valve in the piping. To do these tasks, the robot must be able to grip the stopcock and valve. Normally, we think of gripping as something done with fingers. It turns out that the type of grip only has to match the shape of the thing being gripped. It doesn't have to have a finger-like structure. After repeated trials and errors, the team devised this gripper. So how does it grip objects? 
When pressed against a valve, it wedges itself into the mechanism. Air decompression inside stiffens it. That's how it grips it. The next issue was how to reduce the gripper's weight and size so that it could be mounted on the front of the robot. It seems that the process of making things consists of a series of subtractions. We had to make the gripper lightweight and small. That meant reducing the number of motors in it. Here you can see the gripper the team developed doing some work. We finally came upon this simple and useful mechanism. Meanwhile, another team was working on an active scope camera with a camera and microphones to search for people needing rescue. This team too grappled with new issues. The robot could insinuate itself into narrow spaces, but it couldn't surmount sudden differences in height. To climb over sharp differences in height, the robot would have to be able to lift up its head. We installed air jets on the bottom of the robot head. The air jets caused the head to levitate. Air jets propel the robot upward. But if you simply shoot the jets, this happens. It's hard to maintain stability while raising the head kicks and bucks. Controlling the jets was a challenge. It took a long time to devise a stabilization mechanism so that the body would levitate in a stable fashion. Developing the technology to make the robot float in a controlled manner took two and a half years. The air jet floating technology made it possible to raise the robot head up high so that it could see deep into the rubble. So this is a useful technology for searching for victims. In disaster zones, we depend on the power of construction machinery, but sometimes the disaster site is inaccessible to them. Construction machinery can't be used on highly uneven surfaces, such as soft ground or steep slopes. Another problem is that they crush the rubble beneath them, endangering any victims trapped inside. I think this inability to introduce construction equipment is the biggest obstacle to reconstruction. The key to solving this problem lies in the use of multiple tools. To prevent crushing the debris, it would be useful to have two claws which could pick up the rubble and move it out of the way. But today's construction equipment can't do that. The team defied the conventional wisdom, building a construction robot with two arms. As you can see, this robot looks like a pair of hips with two arms attached. No human or animal looks like this, but we adopted this structure intentionally. With two arms supported on stout hips, the robot can withstand the heavy weight of the debris. A construction robot with two arms, each mounted on an independent swivel, was born. With development complete, it was time for the official field evaluations. The robots were assembled at Tohoku University for assessment in mock-ups of disaster situations to demonstrate the robot's capabilities under field conditions and flush out any problems. Field testing the robots is vital. The final products can only emerge after repeatedly testing under conditions that closely reproduce actual disaster conditions, identifying problems and correcting them. First up was the four-legged robot. The purpose of this robot was to demonstrate high mobility and operating performance in environments too dangerous for humans. The robot was able to slide along its belly, climb ladders, go from lying on its belly to standing up, and even do a handstand. The next robot challenger was the wheel-type serpentine robot. Gathering information, then taking action was its goal. And it succeeded in performing simple operations and putting its unprecedented gripper to work. The robot climbs over obstacles, clears debris with its gripper, and travels through pipes. And now the opening of the valves. The gripper grips and turns the valves surely and smoothly, without any fine positioning. On the outdoor field, the cyber rescue canine, wearing a cyber suit, begins searching for disaster victims. The dog begins the search, seeking
seeking not only the positions of the victims, but also information about the area where they are trapped. The Cyber Rescue K9's actions are measured by sensors on the cyber suit and monitored on a map. Detecting the smell of a victim, the Cyber Rescue K9 barks to alert others. The view as seen by the Cyber Rescue K9 is also monitored. This feed is analyzed by machine learning, leading to the discovery of lost items that lead to the victims. The aerial robot incorporates technologies enabling stable flight even in narrow spaces, strong winds, rain, and other adverse conditions. Using high-precision formation flight, the aerial robots capture photos of the disaster conditions from high in the sky. In this simulation, the drone has suffered a failure. Although two propellers have stopped, tough technology enables the robot to maintain control using the four remaining propellers, supporting normal flight. The demonstration of the active scope camera begins on the debris field. This is also a test of the air jet body levitation system. The robot head floats in a stable manner, overcoming height differences and gaps in the rubble. By obtaining a high vantage point, the robot is able to see well ahead despite obstacles in front. The robot threads its way through narrow gaps pressing deep into the rubble. As it proceeds, it surveys surrounding conditions and listens for victims. Soon, a person in need of rescue is found. The two-armed construction robot, designed for difficult-to-work disaster zones. This robot is mounted with a drone, which is equipped with a power line for long-term operation. The drone supplies images from the wide range of angles necessary for remote operation. The upper of the two arms can handle heavy objects, but it is especially good for delicate, precise work. Tactile impressions on the tips of the arms are conveyed to the operator. Meanwhile, the lower arm handles the heavy lifting, like the hydraulic shovel on a backhoe. A four-fingered hand enables the robot to perform both debris evacuation and removal of obstacles. Research into robust technology made each new robot tougher than its predecessor by overcoming a wide range of issues. Attendees were greatly impressed and hopeful for the future. I think it's amazing that disaster response robots can substitute for people doing the same tasks humans do. I'm impressed by how much robot functions have improved. I think one issue is focusing more closely on the program's goal of achieving tough robotics. I'd also like to see robots like these actually deployed in the field to show the world that we have solutions like these. This is a critical juncture for robot innovation. It is time for industry players to create robot businesses so that the technology will be widely recognized and used. Disasters can strike at any time. We have to maintain robots so that they are ready for deployment whenever needed and keep upgrading them with new technologies. One issue regarding disaster response robots is that for devices used so infrequently, their support costs are high. I think it's hard to maintain public support for robots that are only used when disasters occur. I would like to see robots used in a wide variety of ordinary situations, such as in construction or in inspection of plants and infrastructure. The achievement of disaster response robots will mean greater safety, not only for disaster victims awaiting rescue, but for those of us who rescue them as well. We also hope that these robots will make search and rescue work faster and more efficient. Japan is a country prone to natural disasters. Robots that can provide tough support when disaster strikes will be an eagerly awaited blessing.